It's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's our goal. Hey! It's, our goal. hey. it's time for Breaking Bread with Papa. Hey! Don't you know? Hey! It's also a show. Hey! Everybody, welcome to another edition of Breaking Bread with Tom Papa. I'm Tom Papa. Oh, wow. That's convenient. Very exciting show for you today. We've got Patton Oswalt on the program. Yes, you love Patton. I love Patton. Everybody loves Patton. He's got a new special out on Netflix called We All Scream. Super funny, super great. Really excited for you to listen to this conversation. He's so good. Uh, you know Patton from a whole bunch of places. We'll go through it all in just one minute. Uh, today's show is brought to you by, oh, this is convenient too, TomPapa.com. Wow. <laughs> Very excited for actually this week, Saturday. Oh, this is exciting. Okay, so Saturday, I will be a guest on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. That is always very exciting. And then by the power of magical audio magic, I will be recording my new Netflix special at the Wilbur Theater on Saturday night. If you're in that area or you know somebody who is, there's a few tickets for the 945. The early one is sold out. There's a few tickets for the last show. Either way, I'm just saying it because it's cool and I'm excited for it. And if you have seen me out on tour, you saw bits and pieces of it as we were putting it together. And now we get to actually record the thing and get it out there, which is very exciting. So come in. Uh, Come and see me there. Also, go to TomPapa.com. We've got a lot of great shows coming up. We're coming to The Egg in Albany. We've got Count Basie Theater in Red Bank, New Jersey. Very exciting. Oh, the Come to Papa Halloween show at the Village Underground will be on October 11th. October 11th at the Village Underground. We're going to have Dave Hill, Mike Yard, uh, Keith Robinson, Morgan James. It's going to be a great show. Always love the Halloween show. It's always the most, I think, between that and the Christmas, it's pretty, I think the Halloween one is the most fun. Uh, so that'll be on Tuesday, 730 uh, at the Village Underground on October 11th. Very exciting. I hope you're doing well. It definitely feels like fall. I was thinking, I was just did this great run of shows in California this week, and I was thinking on my way home, you know, I've really got to talk to my agent about hitting my favorite places at the favorite time of year. Because right now, I'm going to have a good swing. We kind of accomplished it with the shows that I mentioned coming up to New England and New Jersey, New York. But I feel like this year, we're kind of missing that fall into winter. Wisconsin, Minnesota, cinnamon buns, just bakery to bakery to bakery in between your shows such a great part of the country for this time of year uh definitely next year we'll have to put it in but knowing the way i book my stuff it'll probably be there in the summer <laughs> uh but yeah last time i was going through wisconsin and doing shows around this time of year it literally felt like we were just on a bakery run it was just little small bakeries just with their own twist of the of their home baked goods just like here you go we know you're you're out there doing your best how about how about you pull over and get a little fatter winter's coming <laughs> it really felt like it was like playing the candyland game or something but uh an amazing amazing part of the country and this is an amazing time of year i can literally feel we have people making thanksgiving plans already saying that they're going to come in and see us. And we're starting to, uh, I am starting to just look at all the equipment. This is not too early to be thinking, do I have a gravy bowl? Do I have my roasting pan? Where did I store that last year? Where is the grate that goes inside the roasting pan? That was my big panic last year. It's not a bad time to start looking at your tools of what you've got coming up. And this is really, like, look, I bake all year round. I bake in the middle of the summer and crank that oven up to 500 degrees. But now it's like 
socially acceptable. I was thinking, I want when I had that show on Food Network, we did this um, thing. Uh, we went through Philadelphia and we went to the market there and hung out with a Mennonite baker who did these cinnamon rolls. And he taught me this very simple way to make them. And I was like, oh, that's this is this is a good time to kind of like sabotage your family who's trying to be healthy or whatever restrictions, diet restrictions they have. This is a good time to start testing them and just have them walk into the kitchen in the morning and just see a pile of cinnamon rolls or a big plate of scones, blueberry scones. Mm. This is the time to do it. So if you are into making this stuff, get on it. If you're not, go buy it. But this is a time to uh, cut loose. And uh, you now have permission. We are rolling into October. So here we come. September and your little skinny ways. You're behind us. It's fat time, baby. So Pat Oswald, how great is Pat Oswald? You know Pat Oswald as a voice as an actor, as a comedian, Emmy award-winning comedian, Grammy award-winning comedian, uh, super prolific, super, super cool. And I do say that he's super cool. We actually talk about it a little bit in the, in our conversation today. He has a very good, he has his finger on the pulse, as they say, of really worthwhile stuff. And I, it's funny because when we talk, he talks about as a young kid having his little, band of uh of friends who just loved comedy and were digesting it and and everybody just kind of finding their way in music and film and and comedy and just all you know when you start really looking at it closely and discerning what's good and what's bad in the arts uh you start to get a real sense of uh of quality and then as he emerges into a comedian and becomes a, a comic uh you bring that that same kind of uh, rough analysis on yourself and on your own work. And then he is, he is, he's truly that way. He is an artist. He Patton cranks out a lot of material, he, a lot of specials. He's always funny. He's always engaging. He's always surprising as a comedian. When you watch another comic and they surprise you with the turn of phrase or just the direction that they're going in the middle of their set, there's nothing more gratifying than that. And I've known Patton for uh, a long time, and you and you have too. He's the voice on uh, the Goldbergs, Ratatouille, of course. How cool is that? Just to be the the voice of that for to the end of time. Uh, he's always appearing in things. He's always working. I remember backstage at UCB, the theater here in uh, in LA, and we were waiting to go on. I didn't really know him that well. Of course, I knew of him, but we really hadn't crossed paths because he was LA, I was New York. And before the show, he someone uh, he had just gotten a copy of Playboy magazine because he had written an article and he had appeared in it. And I remember thinking, man, that is that is cool. And now looking back, excuse me, it's really cool because it shows someone who's writing. <clears throat> excuse me. He's writing all the time. Always writing, always creating. And you'll see him pop up in the New York Times book review or in magazines uh he's just always appearing because he's very prolific and he's always he's always 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 creating and that in any art that is how you stay relevant is always always creating so it was really great in this uh in this little podcast today to sit down with him and really spend some time and you know there's it's kind of like with one of those moments when you uh, are in high school and you're like you see like the kids like you have your crew and it's all it's all good but then you see another crew and you're like man I'm I'd like to poke over there too and the bad part about high school is you only have four years to do it and then if you don't and you, the best you get is someone signing your yearbook we should have hung out man we should have hung out <laughs> The good thing about being a grown up is eventually if you wait and you meander and you find your way and you don't go away, you will actually sit down and hang out with the people who you admire. And that is what we have today with Pat Oswalt. Again, his Netflix special is called We All Scream. 
It just came out on Netflix. Super funny. Watch it. Watch all of his specials. But definitely give this one some love. You'll you'll definitely, definitely enjoy it. Um, all right. There it is. The great intro for the great Patton Oswalt. Enjoy. Are we rolling, Aaron? It's so weird because I'm, I literally was just explaining this to someone else. I was in an interview and I'm like, I used to like last second get there. Me too. Just go up on stage, do it and get, get out. Now I'm like, this is going to be with the shows at eight and there's going to be a sound check at five. Yeah, I'll come. I would rather be, and I think it's an appreciation after the pandemic. I would rather yes. be at show business. Yes. Then sitting in my room doing what? Like just hiding right. in the in the days in. I, I like getting there early too. Yeah, exactly. I'm always, I'm like, give me whatever the cheapest hotel is. Right. Because it's just a flop to me. I don't care. Yeah, right. Um, I'm like, yeah, get me there early. I'll do my sound check. I'll walk around the room, get a feel for the room. Yeah. You feel more like, I don't want to say a rock star, but you feel like, oh, I'm a professional performer. I'm yeah. here early, write out my set. I know. Play the... um. <clears throat> And beat like that. I have a list that I made of music that yeah, I want. Yeah, me too. Radio show music and that plays and that gets me in a good mood. I'm like, okay, good. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. This is great. Yeah, it's show yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. It's like why, we should cherish this. This yeah, is like you should dream about like doing stuff like this. Yeah. Now I'm like, when's the show? Seven? Can you pick me up at seven six forty five? Because the <laughs> opener still got to go on. Like I, I don't want to be that guy. I know that kind of attitude. And you can feel that on stage. The guy that just got there. Yeah. A minute before the show and just is literally timing when they're going to get out of there. Yeah. Uh -huh. like, 100%. No, no. That show day is, that's what I'm doing that day. It's the best. Yeah. Uh, congratulations on your special. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. We all scream. We all scream. I, I just watched it this morning. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's so good. Thanks, man. It really is so good. It was, yeah, it was, I don't know if you experienced this. I was talking to someone else about this. I was actually really nervous because this one is really, really silly and fun. And I was so happy just to be on stage again uh -huh. and the audience was so happy to be out yeah that two months before i taped the special i'd stop and go oh wait is this material actually funny or have i just been happy to be on stage and the audience has been yeah. happy and then they're gonna watch it and go what are they doing There's, and then <laughs> so i really went over the material again okay good these are all jokes I, yeah i'm not just giddy to be out again after the pandemic. yeah no i went through that same thing <clears throat> but what's there's so many interesting things that you do it's really like you're saying like it's all it's it is light and fun and fun and like you play with the audience at a certain point yeah and it's like there is a you're loose you're totally loose but you're also sneaky like you also <laughs> you really are you you also weave in some really profound kind of weighty things that were Thank just kind of like you know you but you don't put them in there and hit club us over the head with it right it's well, really well crafted that way i feel like we don't have a choice anymore like every part of what we do is going to have to be weighty just because of what's going on on the planet like yeah. i think that subconsciously we all feel like something's about to shift uh -huh. so no matter how even a show like um, I think you should leave or like there. Yes, it's very silly. It's very surreal. But then there are some deeper truths going on that he, yeah. he said, you can't club people over the head with it anymore yeah. because reality is clubbing us over the head. Right. So, so be their relief. Right. You know? Right. And maybe f give them a way to like, here's how you can deal with it in a silly way. Yeah. Rather than me reminding you how like, like, we know idiot. You don't need to tell us. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like even the way you, uh, you know, you touch on the vaccine. Yep. Uh, you you touch on um, uh, you touch on towards the end. There was another part. Oh, you just in uh, the oh, it was so great. The the presidents like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. What twenty sixteen was that was the boomers like angry yeah. tantrum. Yeah, I mean you you hit on that. And well, then it was what I was saying was twenty sixteen wasn't unique. Everyone was like, this is a crucible point for America. Has regular crucible moments yeah. where history is hinging and we usually make a bad decision but america is <laughs> has been designed so that it can take these blows and then recorrect itself right which yeah. is kind of cool and it was pretty it was pretty <laughs> interesting because the that moment when the greatest generation was you you say this is look they're they're dying off yeah and this whatever generation is is it's their last 
run and they're mm-hmm. like hey i i was here i'm relevant <laughs> i mattered so here's ronald reagan here's that actor with the chimpanzee <laughs> and we're gonna put him on the thing and it really struck me like because i you know of course aware of and and thought about it, but i didn't think of it in terms of celebrity that was another unstoppable charismatic celebrity he wasn't mm-hmm. as dangerous and and off the wall as, right. the, as the as the last one yeah but it was that thing of like this is kind of the representative of this group right here you, here have at it i also think it was for for comedians what was so fascinating um about trump was whether you like him or not there is a dark pull to what he does he has a dark form of charisma and a lot of comedians who we work on winning the audience over to our side and to see someone go up who's all negatives but in a weird way pulls people in even further is so frustrating but weirdly fascinating for us as performers Mm. to go how do you go up with absolute open contempt for everything and people love you even more that's amazing what do you think it was I I think he was really tapped into, there are a lot of people right now who are justify, justifiably angry, I think, at a lot of stuff, and they can't find the way to articulate it, either because mm-hmm. we've taken all the money out of the educational system, so we've robbed people of their of their words to express how angry they are. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and by the way, I've, I've experienced it too. There are those days where you're like, I just fucking... Mm. Like <laughs> what? What do you? What do you mean? I I can't it just everything. <laughs> mm. And he went up and was that for those people. Yeah. And for a lot of people, that was very. I mean, again, I, I think it's very. I think it's very naive just to go. Well, he's you know he, he's an idiot or whatever. Well, he's clearly not because he still fills a stadium full of people who hang on his every word. There is yeah. a rhythm and a music there that is clearly connecting with people. Mm-hmm. You know what it feels like? People who didn't like Trump, it must have felt like these old stadium rockers when hip hop started coming along and in their ears, it's like, it's just people talking over music. It's like, <laughs> no, they're actually connecting with something that you don't understand. Right, exactly. In a very weird way. Yeah, you know? 100%. So there's something like, I think that always needs to be observed and looked at. Yeah. Rather than dismiss. Look, if, if it's something that big, you can't dismiss it. No, you can't. You have to deal with it and and confront it head on, but you can't just go, well, it's just silly and it'll go away. Well, clearly it ain't going to go away. Well, do you think, (laughs) do you think though that he was unique in his charisma? Like it, it seems to me that he had a thing that was like, he said it himself, you know, like if you were, if I were to shoot someone on fifth Avenue, you know, like he, he seemed uniquely, there was another level. You know what he reminds me of? It's that it's this, Anyone else that was going to try to run, because I, I, I know, you know, in the future, someone's going to try to run the Trump playbook and they're going to turf out so hard because you have to be <clears throat> as purely psychotic and narcissistic as he is. Yeah. Which, which still is belief in himself. A hundred percent. absolutely does not have a shred of doubt in what he's saying. No. And that, con- and that also that absolute confidence in when he said, I can shoot a guy on Fifth Avenue, what he's saying is no matter what I do. If I do something that could harm me, I can turn to my people and go, you didn't just see that. And they would go, okay. Yeah. Because that's how confident he is. I know. And I will tell you you didn't see it and you'll buy it. Exactly. Holy shit. Yeah, it's beyond, I think, <laughs> him even believing it. It's if I just say it. It even, happens. Even with the, with the election, it was... I'm just, he's a guy that never is going to say, he, he, no, I'm not, I'm never going to say I lost. No. I'm, I'm going to will this into existence, which is yep. what his whole career was. He literally could be the greatest positive thinking guru yeah. of all time. Like he oh literally. You're right. It's like he used all the tools of positive thinking, but for negative things. Or just but for he him. Used it brilliantly just for him. Exactly. Yeah. It was almost like he was one of those hypnotists, but he only hypnotized himself. <laughs> right. and, but it worked perfectly because. Because everyone bought it. A hundred percent. It's a, it's a powerful, powerful tool. I remember, have you ever talked to Jeff Ross? Because Jeff Ross kind of knows him uh-huh. before he was president. Oh, yeah. He did some would, gigs. And you do gigs with him. And he's like, one-on-one, he's a very personable, you know, magnetic guy. Like, you yeah. can't, there's something, there's a force to him. Oh, for sure. You know, when you see Charisma. it on a national stage, it looks rotten and scary yeah. to someone like us. But to other people, it's like... No, he's connecting with things 
Um, so again, I don't, I, again, I do like one quick thing about Trump and the whole special because at this point, I, I don't see, I don't know what the point of comedians no. analyzing Trump at this point is. There's no, no. It, it's been analyzed. Yeah. We all know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, exactly. It's definitely you really don't you don't spend any time like really miring, which is which is so <laughs> refreshing. And really, yeah. I literally, I really think uh, we're, we're close in the way that there is always going to be a little optimism in there. Yes, there's not you're not going to you're not nihilistic. You're not you're not giving up. There's definitely, but it's not naive, which is so great. No. It's not put your head in the sand or just be happy. It's real, and what you yeah. address the things you you mentioned the little things, but it's also uh, it's also you give me a little bit of hope, which I really appreciate. I, again, it, I've watched you're doing great so many times, and that whole run that you do about, you know, no, yet yeah, you are getting older and you are getting fatter, and it's great. You're doing like yeah, you're doing so much better <laughs> than anyone else before you has done in history. <laughs> right? You don't know how lucky you are right now. Yeah. Like, there's just that. It's like, oh yeah, that's right. Wait a minute. We, we, you can go buy a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> Do you understand like the miracle world we live in right now? Right. Like, what, why are you so upset? So yeah, that that was yeah. that kind of. And again, you're embracing that that everything's falling apart. Yeah. Personally and cosmically. Yeah. Um. Well, so why not enjoy yourself a little bit? Yeah, but so it? right, but, but yeah, and and you expected what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you expected that. What else was the? Yeah. Uh, how, how are we going to get out of this? Yeah. Another really great thing that you do, and we'll talk about other stuff too. But let me just get oh, a little don't of stop. <laughs> is uh, hang on. <laughs> Sorry. Is uh, the um, uh, I I, I guess I then won't give it away at all. The 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 barn with the uh, with the pubes. <laughs> Cool. The, the barn, barn, barn full of clown pubes. Barn full of clown That's going to be a pubes. track title on the album when I put the vinyl out. So won't like that's not the punchline of the thing. It just says bar, that's how it barn, starts. Yeah. Barn full of clown pubes. But it's really impressive because as a comedian, right? You're yeah. like, okay, he's you're coming into the subject and you're like, you mention something and you're like, wait, let me go back because I know you're thinking it. Let me go back and just say, yeah, I said barn full of clown pubes and. Which is great, and you expect a comedian to kind of address what we just drove sure. past, and we just saw something. Wait, what? Did you see that? Yeah, yeah. It's our job, but you spend so much time and take so many off ramps on it. It was really elegant. It was really a cool thing to watch. Yeah, I'm a big believer in um, that the Tim Conway uh, philosophy of one time, one time it's funny, three times it's not funny, but 19 <laughs> times it's hilarious. Like, wow, he's really going to do it this many times. So I was like, how can I? explore this as deep as I can <laughs> and also like it's that thing and, and you've you've done this too where um if you're having fun up there then they're having fun and I yeah. have a lot of fun doing that yeah you yeah. can tell that I'm just like oh my god I, I like I can't even believe how long I'm going on for which is so stupid I love yeah, it you're like no but wait but wait and you're like what yeah, yeah. <laughs> what patent it's, it's the Todd Glass <laughs> school of comedy of like oh yeah. he's really gonna <laughs> hammer this wow you know yeah it was yeah. really really good you're your writing is so good it's still like the the thing i really i think i was trying to figure out what is it that i really like the most <laughs> is uh surprising your surprising writer like you 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 come up with images wow. that nobody else does which is really you know whenever i'm reading or anything if someone yeah. gives you a phrase and you you haven't seen someone piece that together <laughs> before you're like oh i'm gonna read this it's, whole thing yeah i i was i remember i wrote on the first um borat movie um, at the very beginning of it when Todd yeah. Phillips was director and then they changed directors and I had to go back to King of Queens but we were in the writer's room one day and one of his writers this guy Ant British guy yeah. and we were I was there when, <laughs> when Ant came up with when Borat was talking about how his wife is getting older mm -hmm. and he described her vagine is like the sleeve of a wizard and it's like the whole room like we wanted to like get up and carry him around the room we were so happy like we knew yeah. oh my god not only did he just think up that i got to be here and witness that fall out yeah. of somebody's skull yeah i love that i mean that was my first love when i started doing stand-up is even before going on stage <clears throat> sitting around with comedians yeah and watching them bounce ideas off each other yeah there's nothing like it i know i'm upstream where it's being created i'm not getting it i'm not working in office and getting it when it's finally broadcast yeah i'm watching it get formed <laughs> right exactly. i'm at the factory this yeah. is awesome you know it's really good yeah, yeah yeah really good so um 
I normally, I try and bake bread for my guests. Oh. And um, I got in last night from, uh, from New York at midnight, so I not an excuse. So I didn't have time to bake it. But oh. have you had lodge bread? No. What's These that? guys are maze balls. They're in L.A., and this is their holy. Yeah, shit. you'll bring this home with you. Look at that meteorite. That is that. Oh. That's their olive loaf, which is just bonkers. Yes, it is. And then I think is this the other one? Is this the regular one? There's also a country loaf. Yeah, oh, and this is the country Lord. loaf. Now these things will they'll last for oh, like a week in your home. A week and or can I slice them up and freeze them? You can. And they last you could, forever. You could fr yep, you can do that. Oh my god. This is one of my favorite I want, breads yeah, let's in, do, in in Los Angeles. Are we going to you give them to your guests and they take them home or do you eat them on the podcast? You're going to take them home. Okay. okay. You're going to take them home. Holy moly. But because I was so excited that you were oh coming. Oh god. They have that I'm sorry, I love when the crust gets the tiniest bit burnt. Mhm. Mm that's a key. Yeah. That is a key. Oh. Um, yeah, just the smell is amazing. Oh God. So, yeah, so I wanted you to have these. This is Lodge Bread. They're in uh, Culver City and I think Woodland Hills. They're Ooh. really great guys. They've actually been on the podcast talking about baking the bread. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, I love that you're into bread. Yeah. So, oh, but what I did, good. though, for you mm. this morning uh -oh. was I baked you biscotti. You made me biscotti. I made you your own biscotti. Look, you can feel it. It's still warm. Because I literally—it is warm. Literally, the timing of it was get it in, <laughs> get it out of the oven, get in the car, and be here by the exact time we were going to start. So, You're like Ted Lasso, <laughs> you're making your. Oh my God, that's so adorable. Yeah, so Tom. that's biscotti for you. I had to make you something. It wasn't enough to just turn you on to my favorite this bread. This is insane. Thank you so much. You are welcome. So right now is currently Lodge your favorite bread? Uh, one of them, yeah, definitely. When you, now, when you go to different cities, yes. like Seattle is a crazy farmer's market yeah. restaurant city. Is there a favorite bread up there? I or? don't know of, I don't have one there. In Portland, uh, uh, Ken's bread, Ken Forkish, oh. uh, his bread is just amazeballs. That's Ken's in Portland. bread. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, he's amazing. And, and his, his, uh. Red Book is like my Bible. Oh, it is? Yeah. You should, you know, there's a movie to be made someday or a documentary. You should make it. Um, you know, the big, there was a huge thing in the 70s when Stag's Leap, a California wine, which at the time were like, oh, yeah, wine's from California. It's Hicks. <laughs> and then went over to France and it won this huge, and it was a big, everything changed after that. Right. And then there was the woman... Nancy Silverton, I believe, mm -hmm. who ran Campanile and now runs Moza. Yeah. Her, there was a year, I think in the 80s or 90s, her sourdough bread won up in San Francisco, and it was equally this huge scandal because right. a non-San Francisco bread had never won, and ah. out of nowhere, some <laughs> L.A. restaurant, how dare they? And it was this huge, and it was all about, like, bread. Like, she's amazing. Kind of get it? Yeah, oh, my God. Her she's stuff. amazing. It really is. A, <clears throat> yeah, it's, she's insane. And then that was La Brea, and now that's like a, a line you'll find like in supermarkets. Exactly. And stuff. I used to go to La Brea Bakery. I'd get a baguette, and then I get that pumpkin seed oil. Oh. It was so oil, and it was really dark, and and it just tasted. <laughs> so Patton, good. I never, I don't know the answer to this question. Where did you grow up? Grew up in Northern Virginia, the mm. suburbs of Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia. So very, very. When I say like the suburbs. What suburbs to me means there's no local culture. It is all uh -huh. kind of because people go, you're from Virginia, you don't have an accent. I'm like, yeah, because I'm in Northern Virginia is that sweet spot. Northern Virginia and Southern Maryland, no accents. All right. You go south to where I was growing up, all of a sudden you hear people talking like this. Uh -huh. Down in South Boston, down in Norton, you know, Charlottesville, all that place. Right. If you go north <laughs> of, of any, if you go north of, of, of Southern Maryland, yeah. up, then all of a sudden people just talking like this and it's like, oh, you're in Bomber there, hon. And then all of a sudden they got that <laughs> accent. So I was in the sweet spot of no accent. Oh, interesting. That, yeah, so just the suburbs. <laughs> like the most... Um, <clears throat> That's why I think Spielberg's movies landed on me so hard. Yeah. Because I'm like, that's my world. Right. That's absolutely where I'm living right now. Bicycles, Bicycles cul-de-sacs. And also um, uh, half-built houses that you would then do war games in and do... Right. War. I think all, every new development should like build, like, start two houses and then stop <laughs> so that kids can just run around and play in them. That's a great time to, way to spend your time. <laughs> that really is. It really was amazing. Yeah. Like, turn them into all these really cool, you know... 
How many did stuff. you have? Like a crew? I had my little crew of a uh, little, uh, and it was we were it, our my crew was um, the comedians clique. I was uh-huh. I wasn't the class clown. I was in a clique of class clowns. It was uh-huh. People that we were all obsessed with comedy. Oh so really? It was me and five, and I just I just got together with them all. Come Last, closer to the mic, just in case. I just got back together with them all. <laughs> you did, um, yeah. And here's a new tune from Seals and Croft. <laughs> uh, to, right before the pandemic, we got back together in um, <clears throat> Chesapeake, Virginia. Me and my four guys in an abandoned house. <clears throat> we should have found an abandoned house. It would have been perfect. It was this really nice house down on the uh, on the Chesapeake Bay. It was beautiful. And wow. we just, it was like guys in their 50s amazing crabs and drinking wine and going remember when you used to like <laughs> it's like i was trying to convince them all that i was a werewolf because i was really into monsters <laughs> and then another one was like it was just all that you know your crazy memories all yeah coming. that's amazing how many how many guys uh see adam sean eric bruce david me nice. and scott so yeah that's a good crew so, yeah and then david couldn't make that one so that was the other one. and yeah we were all guys that were like any new album that came out, mm. memorize it. We could recite it. We, whatever good bit was on <laughs> SNL that weekend, we would recite that. And we, you know, <laughs> we went through the bad years of SNL, and then suddenly Eddie Murphy came along. Right, it was amazing again. Yeah, quoting things. Yeah, we discovered SCTV, which which was on <laughs> afterward. And we felt like we're getting away with like, what is this? Yeah, exactly. So it amazing. seemed so like underground. Yes, and weird, really did, and like <laughs> so low budget. Like I think I could shoot that, <laughs> yeah. but it was so brilliant and funny. You know. Know? Yeah. Like, so we were all, but I was the only one that decided to make it a vocation. But if, if you had gone back to see me in middle school and high school, yeah. I wouldn't have stood out as, well, that guy's going to be a professional comedian. Oh, no. Like, oh, that's a bunch of nerds that are all into comedy. Uh, and then recite Monty Python bits. Right. And recite everything. Cheech and Chong. We can recite <laughs> all that stuff. Is that, I mean, is that, yeah. is that how it started with you? Oh, 100%. The same. This, absorbing. This exact same story at the exact same time yeah. in New Jersey. Oh, wow. Yeah. And we, I remember. Suburbs? What was, or did you have suburbs? To a city? It was suburbs, but we were like only 30 minutes from New York. So you could get into a city. We could. I mean, we couldn't, but I, I we, could. they, people took us there. <laughs> yeah. If, if somebody took me there, but unfortunately, all my the older people I knew that had cars were like, yeah. we're going to do whippets in uh, Eric Murdo's garage. <laughs> and we're going to got the, have you heard of this band called The Doors? Yes. Yes. It's by, please. Can we? <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a whole punk scene happening in D.C. that I can't get to. Yeah. <laughs> It was nuts. I remember we saw, uh, it was VCRs, and oh. we got a tape of uh, Love Bites with um, uh, oh, George Hamilton. Love at First Bite. Love at First Bite oh. with George Hamilton. So good. And there was this one scene when he turns into a bat, and he's like going through the city, and he like goes through an apartment, and they're like, and a, an uh, I guess like a Puerto Rican family thinks he's a chicken. Yes. Get a chicken, get the pot, it's a chicken. And they, <laughs> We watched that scene like a thousand times, crying yeah. on the ground. Yeah. And that was what we did. We just go to someone's basement yeah. and we'd watch those things over and over and over. Yes, I had my, a friend of mine on the block, Adam Miles, that was <laughs> um, for my crew. His parents got the first VCR, the <laughs> top loading, no rewind, Ooh. no pause, probably cost seven grand <laughs> yeah. looked like it ran on steam and then we had there was that early yeah. company magnetic video who at the time uh, th- that's a weird history too where they were like can we put your they would go to the studios and the studios were like yeah i don't no one's gonna buy these yeah. like they didn't see that it was going to become this so uh-huh. there was that first initial mash texas chainsaw massacre and we, so we'd just be watching all these movies and yeah that's how, like my access to Stuff like Eraserhead and Pink Flamingos and Texas Chainsaw was because of my friend's VCR. Right. I'd go to his house and watch things. Right. You who, know? who was the coolest of the crew? Like that, who was the one that uh, that was the tastemaker? Because you became the tastemaker yeah. in our comedy world. Yeah. Well, it was it was weird. Um, Adam was kind of the tastemaker only because he had he had the cool parents, uh-huh. um, which meant that his parents would smoke weed in front of him. Uh-huh. And although. <laughs> I, I, and I've talked about this too. The the 
my friends with the cool parents that would let you do whatever you wanted, it's because their parents were also kind of irresponsible and scary. Yeah. I had the boring parents that were also dependable. So <laughs> right. I could depend on them, like the house would be yeah. okay, but then my friends, they're <laughs> like, hey, we're all gonna take hula dancing lessons, man. And then they would forget to pay the bills. Like, so <laughs> you, 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 like you had that weird push pull and then yeah. they were all getting divorced. All, yeah. all my friends' parents were getting divorced. Mine stuck together. Right. Um, so there was that weird, like, a lot of my friends whose parents got divorced, they rebelled by being married and being very steady uh -huh. and raising their kids. And because I had the steady Eddie parents, I was like, I'm gonna go tell dick jokes to drunks. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Because the world makes sense. Yeah, you know, right, them. yeah, yeah. So there was that weird, so yeah, it, and, and it shifted. Adam was the tastemaker as far as getting access to movies um, and stuff like that. Yeah. Scott was the tastemaker. Scott and Sean were the tastemakers as far as like music was concerned. Uh -huh. uh, my friend Bruce was the tastemaker for like books and like, you know, yeah. you know like, like Stephen King, well, where do you read Peter Straub? Like he was always, <laughs> yeah. he always one up you. And then yeah. I forgot who got us into Dungeons and Dragons, but it was like <laughs> everyone played a different role in terms of like what new nerd thing would we open up? Right, right. That yeah. is cool. I liked during your special when a guy yelled something about a uh, DC comics. And uh, you're like, slow your roll. Yeah. I, 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 I deal with the nerd please, stuff. Please <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's Back true. Off. Yeah, I, I start talking to the crowd because, again, I was so excited. It wasn't, it's not like I'm going into the crowd and going, you look like this. And, no, you know, it was I'm just, I very uniting. I to them yeah. because I'm just so happy that people came out. I can't believe it. I, that's the way I've, I've been on faces. the road. It's like, yeah. this is like the most fun that you're having is yes. like who are you people what are you doing what's here going on? what's yeah. going on in the front row let's get a let's get a core sample of the area so yeah. what do you do here yeah was your mom a good cook um, who, who was cooking my for mom you? and dad were equally good cooks my it would just depend my mom would really was really good at like stews and um like making chicken and tacos my dad was really good at chili and barbecuing Ooh, nice. so so i i always had that like equal you know, you're good at this, you're good at this. Uh -huh. And they would both do that. So yeah, it was. Yeah, well, yeah. that's good. How and about you? Were, were your grandparents around? Grandparents were around. We yeah. had, it's, it's weird. We had my dad's parents, the Oswalds, were all these ex-army people, would live out in the desert, <laughs> swam, hiked, uh -huh. rode bikes, and would drop dead when they were 50. Like they, they, were, they were so healthy and they would die. <laughs> and then my mom's family were the most sedentary the run folas uh -huh. god bless them they're so <laughs> self-abusing the worst diets um drinking and they just lived forever <laughs> forever and it was like um my mom would always joke like well that's because because she was talking about my her parents ailments constant ailments and like that's the run full of curse i'm like well i think the run full of curse is life i think you're cursed to live this miserable long life of ill health whereas right. the oswalds are super healthy and then they just drop they don't experience the bedridden times so they just drop it's crazy are your parents still around still around yeah that's yeah, good dad's still around they still live in herndon oh nice your folks still around yeah in New Jersey? In, uh, yeah, like northern New Jersey. They just dipped over into the New York side of it. They How did they feel when you started doing stand-up? Did, uh, did they know it was coming or it was like, wait, you're what? They knew it was coming, but they wanted me to get a degree. So, so I had to finish college. Yeah, me too. Now, okay, did you go through this? Sophomore year of college was when I, between um, freshman and sophomore year of college, yeah. that summer, started doing stand-up. Oh, yeah? And it clicked instantly for me. I'm like, I know this is what I'm gonna do. Yeah. And then by the time sophomore year ended, I was getting booked regularly. Right. So the last two years of college were still fun, but it felt like, I don't need to be here anymore. I know yeah, what I wanna do. Right. There's people here that they don't know what the hell they wanna do. They should stay, but I should get out there. <laughs> yeah. Did you have, were you doing it during college? Yeah, I started, I didn't do stand-up until I, I would record my, I had a job where I was a uh, security guard at like, the suburban house that was unfinished. Oh, you had to go in the development. Oh, my because job, of the copper wire and stuff. My job was to sit in my car in the middle of the night and just sit there. And there was no really? action. No one was coming to rob anything or do anything, but I would have to sit in there. And I started recording myself on a recorder like doing stand up in wow. there. Cause I always wanted to be a stand up, but I was like, I've got to, I'm in school. Right. But when, uh, so I didn't do stand up until I got right out of college. But oh. while I was in college, I start I just went to the drama department. Smart. And I just started 
doing plays and taking all their classes and that Got was comfortable on stage oh a hundred percent and that was just like that's where i lived all through school you are very you 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 have that thing that a lot of comedians um have the really really good ones and some of them don't unfortunately which is you don't mind going for a while without a laugh you have that confidence of like i'm gonna talk for a bit. I, we know we're getting somewhere and you can tell when a comic is needy and thinks like every second there better be laughter up there, <laughs> noise it's like no actually the, if you keep it silent for a while then it's an explosion with something funny a hundred percent but it's yeah. so funny that you say that because as i was watching you this morning mm-hmm. i was like why can't i be like Patton and <laughs> And enjoy some space before you get to the thing. Oh, you have? Oh, come on. <laughs> I swear to God. In really? my mind, it's, yeah, it's it's loud and fast. I In my mind. You have moments <laughs> where you're just like, again, yeah. again, you have this great thing, too, where a lot of comedians have the, here's this thing that's crazy, and then I've got to tell you what's crazy about it. And you, you and this, I think, really connects you with the audiences. You don't mind being overwhelmed to the point of, <laughs> I don't have anything to say about this. I'm just putting this out to you <laughs> just so that I can know that I'm not going crazy. You all see this, too, right? right. That's all I like. Like, being overwhelmed is a very real human thing, and I yeah. think a lot of comedians don't like being in that position. Uh-huh. And you have that thing where you're like, and I, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's too big, <laughs> which is a very real thing as you get older. Like, I'm just absolutely overwhelmed. What the fuck am I supposed to say about this? They don't eat bread. <laughs> you, you sound like you're at the end of like a horror movie, and you're telling everyone, what, they don't eat bread. Run. You understand what we're dealing with? <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> I did have a thing though. It was kind of a shift because it was acting for four years oh, and then yeah. and then got up to New York and started going to do stand up mm-hmm. where I could tell that people on the scene were like, Oh, there's an actor that showed up and is trying to do stand up. Oh. Like there was that which I totally got. Oh yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, because you just you had confidence and could stand up there with nothing, mm-hmm. but you didn't know how to be a comedian yet. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, that yeah, was, yeah. that there were, that's a, that's a difference. Yeah. I remember um, when I was doing, uh, I, I hosted a weekly open mic when I was in college at the local comedy club in Williamsburg, which was the best, that's the best training for a young comedian. You, I have to go up every Wednesday, no matter what. Yeah. It, even if I right. go up and eat it. The guy's like, oh, see, you're just hosting. I'll see you next week. Like, they don't give a yeah, shit. No. So you're like, oh, you see, so you get over the fear of failing because you're like, you wake up the next morning, the world's still running. Right. They're going to see me. They're going <laughs> to give me my $5 next week. It's not, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and you would see that. I, I remember that very um, distinctly. You would see comedians whose writing was incredible and like, oh, but you don't know how to deliver it yet. Right. But you have the goods and then other people who are just the stagecraft is amazing. Right. But they're not saying anything. Yeah, yet. exactly. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, it was really weird. <laughs> yeah, it's very, when you first started like that with just when you were saying like the world keeps moving, do you remember the times when you were like, you had a show that, and you woke up and knew you had a show that night where the whole day was just... Uh, ruined <laughs> yes oh that would be every day i mean for the first year and a half every day if i had a show night yeah. and the only nights i could get on stage at the time because i was also had to work during the day and and work as a party dj were tuesdays and wednesdays that was it right at garvin's downtown right right I, 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 the, there was a place called the comedy cafe but you had to get past there uh-huh. and i was like well instead of wasting time it was like, you got to hang out for a while. Right. Like, well, I'd rather go to a place where I know I can get up rather than <laughs> waste these precious nights hanging yeah. to then get a set. That doesn't right. make sense to me. Mm-hmm. So I just went with the sure thing. And then later on, when I was able to not DJ, and I could drive it to Baltimore, I'd do the Comedy Factory outlet on a Thursday open mic. Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, those show days, it was all, it's all I would think of. Yeah. And I would go over. I remember uh, I was talking really early on in my career about you got to get ready and i get in my and this older comedian was like you have to get to a point where going on stage does takes up none of your thoughts right and he described he was talking to jerry seinfeld off stage as they're introducing jerry and jerry's talking about like baseball or something uh-huh. and literally mid-sentence they're like jerry seinfeld he goes i'll be right back and then just <laughs> walks up yeah destroys comes back and then continues the conversation oh that's yeah. right like, like a great <laughs> yeah people that are, who are it's like true. professional welders or professional chefs you can't be thinking like there's stuff you got to be doing secondhand 
but that I, ha- I hadn't gotten there yet. There's no. I was gonna say there's no way to cheat it. That's the no, thing. It, you can't cheat it's it. It's over and over yeah. and over again until you're like, I don't need to think about that. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone was talking to. There's this great writer named Alan Moore. Did Watchmen and you know Swamp Thing. He's a great. Kind of, yeah. But they say, and you don't even outline your uh, your stuff anymore. And he's like. Well, I've been writing for 35 years. If I still have to outline something, I'm in trouble. Right. Like I shouldn't have. When you're starting, you absolutely should outline your stuff. Yeah. I don't need to do that. I've been doing this so long. <laughs> yeah. I kind of know how it's going to come out. <laughs> right. Like they're talking to Stephen King. Like you don't keep an ideas notebook. He goes, kind of don't need to. <laughs> right. I, I know what the which ideas are going to work. And once I get the idea, boom, it's, it's yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've been doing it nonstop since I was 18. <laughs> right. Exactly. I don't need to think about this shit anymore. <laughs> yeah. You know. I do have to remind myself once in a while that I'm funny. <laughs> like, oh, you know I, what I mean? Well, I think every, I th- that's the, I, I've gone through this too. I remember this and I tell a lot of young comedians this, you're going to hit the, and this will happen over and over again. You will hit moments where you're like, have I just stopped being funny? Right. Uh, because you're always trying to write new stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and it, once you get to stuff that you know is going to work, then the fun and the excitement's gone. Right. And, and you will lose a little bit of the energy in delivering it, and then it won't work as well. And you can't, and I panicked that way. Uh, and I remember this very distinctly from <laughs> January of 1994 to May of 1994, <laughs> I got into my own head. Uh-huh. And I remember distinctly why I did it because I went up. I was at Swanee's, the Comedy Underground in Seattle uh-huh. on a and I Thursday through Sunday, th- some of the best shows of my life, of my young career at that yeah. time. Like and literally driving back down to San Francisco going, I think I might be the next one. Like, I think <laughs> it's coming together. Uh-huh. And so then I started thinking every one of my sets matters. Right. This is like 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 my art took over my life. Right. And I was so in my head and people could see that I was in my head that then I just started eating it every to the point Whoa. where people would even other comedians would go, How are you gonna torpedo it tonight, Patton? Because they cause it was just became this thing. And why why do you not, think what was happening? I was inside my own head. Yeah. I had just broken through in terms of material, uh-huh. but I hadn't broken through in terms of a new level of comfort. Uh-huh. I was still comfortable on stage, but I wasn't comfortable enough to go to to stop and go I, i'm actually in some my fucks i've i've lost it for a second and and make that right. funny right you just um, hung because, on to cuz i was all about everything has got to work and i can't show any yeah hesitation so beca- and when people see that neediness it ain't funny anymore yeah and and so for four those five months i was really freaking out like i don't I think i got to quit i think yeah. that's it and then finally i started acknowledging it on stage Mm -hmm. like i would do a bit and it would eat it i'll go i'm sorry that bit was actually really good but i just delivered it like i'm begging you for like a pint of blood like i'm dying (laughs) and that's not fun you don't want to see that from a guy and they would kind of laugh at it and then that's how right once i acknowledged how uncomfortable i was and 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 then i thought wow so that's taken care of but then about five or six years later i went through another version of it Mm -hmm. And, and also it happens when there's always new people coming up it's either new people coming up or people that you know that you're a fan of. Yeah. But in your head, you have them placed at a certain level, but then they suddenly evolve. Yeah. And you're like, whoa. And then you start thinking in terms of, well, are people thinking that I'm not as funny? And right. you got to keep reminding yourself, no one's thinking about you. No. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> That's no one, a no one is huge ke- key. No one is keeping a chalk thing of like, you know, this week, I'm sorry, but I got to put Burr ahead of Oswald. I mean, that, you know, yeah. like, no one gives a fuck. They just want to come to a show and be, no one and, cares. And be happy when your friends are doing well because yep. it means comedy's doing well. Yep, 100%. It means people are excited about what you're doing. Yeah. That, yeah. Especially in the early part, the isolation, not realizing no one else is thinking about you. No so why are you thinking, thinking about, you thinking about, why are you thinking about everybody else? Yes. That was They're like. They're not thinking of you. There was a run when I first got past at the Comedy Cellar. And she put me on after a tell for like a month straight. Oh. And oh. it got so in my head because I'm watching him and I'm like, well, I'm not that. And then I would yeah. go up there and try and be that. Mm-hmm. And Tom Papa is not David Tell. And oh. the audience knew it. I knew it. I was just, and the only thing that got me out of it was staying upstairs until he 
came up the stairs like because then yeah. you knew like okay the he's done and the and the um, mc's up and now i can go down without seeing dave exactly. and it, it had to like shed just yeah. this is just put on blinders just be mm -hmm. on your own be alone yeah that was uh that was that was tough to i had to go through that with a lot of people that i knew coming up that i thought were so amazing i still think are amazing but then you evolve to another level where you can actually watch someone who isn't you mm -hmm. who is brilliant but it, and it doesn't affect you anymore no, it because doesn't. you're like and like you are like when i follow like todd glass to me is like a force of nature <laughs> he really is and, so and he used to be like i remember at the largo <laughs> like following him. Well, yeah. very quickly they learned the Largo, just put him on last. No one, <laughs> don't put, it's, that's just unfair to everyone. He <laughs> should close the goddamn. Yeah, I think even when he would open up for like yeah. Sarah Silverman on the road, Sarah would go, I'm gonna do my 45 <laughs> and then you can go on at the end. <laughs> Fuck this. I'm still gonna pay you, but you're not, I'm not uh, fucking going on after you. Cause he literally like does seismic damage, but. He really does. But I had him, he wanted to do, one of my Pat and Oswalt Walton friends show, and then I was kind of going, I was, I was in my mind, I'm like, well, I'm gonna ask him to go on after me, fuck this, I don't yeah. wanna. But then I'm like, no, let's just watch, and I watch him, and I actually enjoyed him, and then went on stage, still laughing about some shit he was doing, uh -huh. and then went into my own stuff, and it felt like so liberating. That's a big deal. To not be in that head. That's a big, people don't understand like what yeah. that mental gymnastics of that, <sighs> what that I entails. Have, I have, I, I've seen, I've had to follow people that and you could see in my like in my face like i i would rather watch 10 more minutes of him than this what i'm about to do i'm really sorry that i'm up here like you you feel the apology coming out yeah of it was just oh yeah. my god but that's the other that back to what you were saying before of like if you acknowledge it then you're okay if yes. you acknowledge if you don't and you desperately try they they see you struggling <laughs> right just fucking acknowledge it all the time yeah, yeah th there's that um God, I'm sorry, you're bringing up a, a tell at the cellar. I've seen a yeah. tell go up. I've been in there. There's like eight people in the room, and he <laughs> ma he makes that, and he's not getting laughs. But then he makes this meta thing where, because the laughs aren't coming, that's what becomes what's hilarious, <laughs> and then it just destroys you. I he's know. the only comedian that oh, I remember. I watched. I was watching him at the Punchline in San Francisco. Brian Posehn and I went up for a wedding. Uh -huh. We got there a day early. And went. Oh, it tells the Punchline. Good. And we went and saw him and I I had to go back in the kitchen and not hear a chunk of his act because I thought I was gonna throw up. Like it was too much laughter. And I, I don't know if he, I remember it was like to the point where even the crowd wasn't laughing anymore because you're yeah. like, <laughs> Stop. It's fucking Jesus Christ. And then I saw him like a year later and he had worked in like a lull where he just talked to the crowd a bit and like it was almost like he instinctively went, I'm giving him too much. I got to let him get their breath back. Right. Like right. I thought I was going to throw up. <laughs> I, it, it was too much. It was like, remember like when you get too high and you're like, yeah. oh fuck, this isn't oh, shit, man. I should have stopped it. What? That's how he is on stage. It's ridiculous. I know. I, 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 that, um, he came up on when I was doing the radio show mm -hmm. and I just had that moment where he was just on and like was just started devouring me and the people and everything you just like oh. being on stage while it was happening like i see why jeff ross was like this is we've got to do this like you can yes literally feel it oh you can literally feel yeah it's like watching nolan ryan throw a fastball <laughs> it's just like there's he's changing the energy in the room yeah right it now. is one of those things like i have these sometimes in the morning when i get up and i gotta write and i, I need to get my creative juices going like you know you do like stretches and poses <laughs> to get the body moving yeah. but there's mental and visual things i'll watch and the three that i will watch on youtube uh -huh. i'll watch clip things of gail sayers running uh -huh. there's something about it looks supernatural what he's doing wow it does i'll also watch greg giraldo doing roast those collection of all his best roast jokes <laughs> yeah or i'll listen to um uh road work uh david tells road work when he starts talking to the crowd because he, i don't even listen to the jokes anymore it's just uh -huh. the rhythm of it really the absolute comfort and confidence it is such a like morning pick me up for wow. for comedians like oh okay yeah yeah and, and i really there are times when i have to stop because i'll catch myself kind of doing that thing with the way that he'll like yeah, and right. i'm like i fucking don't want to do that because that's that's a tell i can't do, you know i you know get really really i mean his you know. cadence is so powerful oh my god yeah that's that was the thing like when i was there at the cell i was like i'm, I'm up here like 
doing a corny version of yes. what he of what yeah. he just did. Yeah, I understand being out of the room with someone like him who has such a strong voice. Yeah, they like when you're early. I, yeah, yeah, even if I try not to. I will end up using those inflections. Yeah. And you get really self conscious. And then you start seeing people on the scene doing them. Like people started oh. doing Louie, people were doing Mitch yep. Hedberg, you know? Got Mitch, Zach, um, uh, Sarah Silverman. Um, you know, yeah. Doing the, the cutesy and then saying something horrifying. <laughs> right. You know? But, <laughs> yeah. And, and, she, and what was weird was she was really the only person who could pull that off. I know. It was so I hilarious. know. Yeah. Exactly. You saw a lot of people kind of burn their careers to the ground going, what a fucking racist. I'm doing what Sarah's <laughs> doing. Yeah, but you can't, you, you can't do that. Don't do what she's doing. You can't pull it off. When you're, um, when you're not, when you don't have other things pulling your time, which you you work in, an incredible amount, when you're always acting and flying someplace, and I know you have insane. all these other things. When you are, when you have those moments when you don't, mm -hmm. is there a daily ritual to your work that you like? What's the happy spot for that, your for your ritual? The happy spot for my ritual is around 10 a.m. to noon. Is I just as much as I would love to be one of those people that can get up really early. Yeah, that's what's coming up. In the morning, I'm just a terrible morning person, and I've got to get nothing works right in the morning. Uh -huh. Everything is so I've got to like <laughs> so hydrate, eat, um, you know, just get everything stretched out. And then for some reason, 10 a.m. to noon, if I get that time, uh -huh. and I've been like, um, today I because oh, I had a breakfast with a friend at 9 a.m. If I'm if I'm running around like doing voiceover stuff, yeah, and I get there early, and I'll get and I'll go. Is there a conference room I can go sit in, and then I'll put in earbuds and just try to write jokes or try to write anything uh -huh. like is there an idea let's see where this goes like right. just waves and i've really gotten over the idea of got to finish it today no right. sometimes you can just mess around yeah yeah you know no so if i can get those two hours mm -hmm. that's all i need now when you have those the uh the dusting off of the <laughs> of the monster <laughs> that is you waking up oh. uh, can you allow things to come in can you look at your phone can you look at the news or do you do yeah. you try and keep that out? I do have well in the morning. I do have little. <laughs> I do a game called Framed, which is a movie guessing game. Uh -huh. a game called Lookdal and and then Wordle. Bam, bam, bam. Oh really? And Hurdle. I go right through those four. Uh huh. Then I do my Duolingo because you got to <laughs> do stuff in another language. So that gets what me language? Much. Uh, I'm, I go back and forth between Italian and French. Nice. Right? Both Italian and French. Bravissimo. Uh, uh, grazie. <laughs> um, and then. Um, I, then I just, I, then I try, I don't judge anything that I'm looking at in terms of scrolling uh -huh. or looking at it like a magazine article or whatever. I'm like, yeah. this time it doesn't matter. You can waste it, but you're just, you're eating, you're fueling up. But then at 10, I try to make it that here I got music. Um, do not disturb on the phone. Yeah. So I block it out for two hours and I just write. Right, you know? right. And I don't judge what it's going to be. You have to also, because I used to be like, you got to write from nine to this is a job and you got to get those hours in. Well, that's silly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and a lot of times my two hours of writing is an hour of just sitting there. Yeah. Getting to the deep thoughts, but nothing happens. Right. And then at the, maybe you'll get 15 minutes in, but that's worth it. And I've had to, I've been with people. Luckily my wife understands this. I've dated people who didn't understand this uh -huh. where I'm like, I need to go write for two hours. And they're like, okay. Yeah. And they'll come in after half an hour and go, oh, I thought you said you were writing. I'm like, I am. Yeah. This is part of it. Do not come in and start going, what are you doing? Let's see what you've done. You know what like, I literally. What are you doing? You know what you I know? literally type sometimes, a lot of times, if, if anyone else is in the house, because yeah. interruption is the biggest killer. Oh. And they don't understand that you're sitting there is still writing it's so absolutely I literally, writing I literally write if I hear people coming up the stairs or coming close to the office I start typing and I literally type out this is the noise that we make to make it seem like we're writing this is what the noise we make to make it sound like we're writing because they hear oh he's busy but if you're just sitting there looking out the window they think oh I can get in there now it's the fucking shining <laughs> yeah. well, but luckily, yeah. you know, I, I'm very, very open with my wife about like, if you run into friction, you go, I need this from you to function Yeah. rather than sit there and be resentful. Like, well, don't people can understand. <laughs> Why don't you tell them? Yeah, tell Most them. Most people right? will go, oh, absolutely. Go do what you got to do. You know, yeah. luckily but, she's an actress, so she understands the idea of getting somewhere, even if it's weird. Yeah. She goes, if you walk by my office <laughs> and I'm just bouncing a ball against the wall, you know what I'm doing? I'm writing. Right. That's writing. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't look like it but trust me something's happening did you ever hear the amos oz quote he's an israeli no. writer he says that a writer's job you uh, as a writer you're really a shopkeeper and it's your job to open up the shop 
every day and it, some days it'll be busy some day there'll be no customers whatever but you that's not be there you just have to be there that's a fucking great way to think isn't about it, it. I, yeah i hang on that every day it's your wow. job to, oh it's just your job to open up the shop and go and sit behind the register <laughs> i look well i just i'm reading a book right now that comes out next year uh, by Joe R. Lansdale, who's another, he's a machine, and he just loves to write. And he had a, th and it's a book about a writer. It's a, it's a like a uh -huh. horror science fiction book. But there, at one point, he's trying to get some writing in, and he and he's like, I used to, I used to think I've got to sit here, and so that the muse visits me. Uh -huh. And it took me years to go. Oh no, you're the muse. You you sitting down is the muse arriving. Uh -huh. So don't think it's something outside of yourself. You're the muse. Wow. You're you're putting on a bit. The paper is waiting for you. That's which great. Is a great. That mindset. is great. But the shopkeeper's great too. Yeah. yeah. I gotta and the first half an hour of opening up the shop is just doing what seemingly are mindless things. But yeah. That's all crucial. And some that's days, all important. Thank. And some days, those glorious days, you open the shop, and all of a sudden, people are just showing up, uh, yeah. and you're it's, you're busy, Holy and you got shit. oh my god, Here there's a lot happening, yeah, and yeah. that wouldn't have happened if you didn't show up and unlock the door. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I was really lucky that I got to be friends with this amazing writer named Harlan Ellison, um, who passed away a few years ago. He he'd written like more than a thousand short stories. Oh my god, like eighteen. Not, he just wrote everything. He, yeah, he was this amazing writer. And he said, um, the trick isn't becoming, or anyone can become a writer. Mm -hmm. The trick is staying a writer. Yeah. That's nearly impossible. And uh, that same thing to me applies to comedy. Yeah. It's very easy to become a comedian. Right. Staying a comedian almost never happens. A no, it, it's, it's very rare. rare. It's really rare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those guys that write that much, you ever see like Mark Twain's autobiography? No. It's like th two or three volumes that are like, dictionary size Jesus but he just never stopped writing and I just saw in, at, a, at a book market back east over the weekend Bernard Shaw's letters another dictionary just the letters just the letters yeah, that exactly. he wrote not his plays none of yeah, that yeah. just the letters that he wrote people these guys were just writing like it's hard to get through the Mark Twain autobiography because it's you don't even understand what he's he's yeah. talking about like some local politician you know they had an issue with this thing and it was just like right. but just non-stop Production. I, I sometimes I wish that that um, like, how can I put this? I remember I was talking. This is going to sound really weird. I was talking to Kevin and Bean uh -huh. about all their bits that they did on their show, which a lot of them are goofy, a lot of them are disposable, whatever. However, by accident, they did create a weird shadow history of contemporary LA in whatever bit they were doing, talking about local stuff. Right. It would be so interesting if someone compiled like a CD box set yeah. with like a book of notations of this bit, this was going on there and that's what they're making fun of. Right. Because, and if you want to know what people, everyday people were thinking of it, this yeah. bit actually kind of nails it. I know it seems disposable at the time. It's local. Yeah. And it's, time, it's of its time. But this, that's why like... Yeah, the further you it, get away, the more But valuable. that's why like historians are so happy when they find like troves of like gossip magazines right because like but that's what everyone was actually thinking yeah you know that's very valuable super to valuable find that stuff yeah yes there are the big important history that's great yeah but but when you can find out what people were like you know were making it's, fun of or the jokes they were doing perfect that is the, that that is the thing with comedy also it really i mean i love it like we we both grew up on it mm -hmm. and digest it and i can appreciate like jack benny now like watching yes. old things but it is really so in the moment. Like even our yeah. even our greats, mm -hmm. Carlin seems to be the only one that that sticks around. Because he was talking about such cosmic things right. that will always be there. But even his earlier stuff, he had very specific things. He talked about Muhammad Ali, right? And stuff like that. But he I mean, he was already so wise to the world, yeah. That as he grew older, it just got more and more. But again, but sometimes is... the specific stuff it also makes you go, oh, well, that's like there's an old Woody Allen bit where he's talking about, yeah, I'm getting into writing. I'm going to do a, a nonfiction version of the Warren Report, um, <laughs> which you realize, oh, and this is like right after the assassination. You're like, oh, even then, right? People were like, going, well, that was bullshit, right? Yeah, Cle like so, it, it, whether or not you believe in that stuff, you're like, that was the mood of the country, right? And that and then that just got captured on tape. Yeah, that's his. That's a historical document. Yeah, but at the same time, and this gets into like cancel culture and all this stuff. 
you have to know going into comedy that you have signed up to do something that is ephemeral that will of most of it is going to be washed away yeah and you can't get angry at that no and, and you see a lot of comedians i'm not going to name them they're older ones who are always whenever you see someone go comedy stopped being funny and they and they name a year like, <laughs> yeah when you were 23 years old <laughs> right. when you were young and vital and it's no comedy has only gotten better it yeah has not gotten worse no nope. it's gotten so much better than it ever was yeah these people that are like it's the early days of like cream you can say that <laughs> cream magazine is great yeah gotten even better yeah it's exactly even better we've moved forward yeah. we've you moved still, forward you couldn't do a lot of carlin stuff today yeah exactly because he would do even better stuff right he would do even more but like yeah. that's what's great about it and you can't like I'm I'm not one of these comedians that's excited about that's angry when a young comedian comes up with a point of view that I either don't agree with or I never saw before because it means the field in which I'm working is still vital right exactly and not dying yeah and you it's know? and it's this ongoing conversation and that young that young new perspective is going to push anyone else that's in the game and the yeah. audience at the same time because is there anything could you can't imagine anything more nightmarish than being the funniest comedian and the last funniest comedian to do comedy and now you got to you're like that's it right i thought people would then i wanted to see people go beyond me yeah. and surprise me all the time right exactly i want to be excited by that shit i don't want yeah. to be the funniest last time it was funny was him well that's horrible you have such a great you have <laughs> such a great bit in uh in your your new special uh of and it just relates because i i always have sirius xm on in the car mm-hmm. 